Welcome to season six of the RAG podcast. Now, for those of you who don't know, the RAG stands for Recruitment Agency Growth. And this show has been around since early 2019. And every week, we are obsessed with finding out how the world's most successful and innovative recruitment agencies and their founders have got to where they are today. In season six, alongside the founder's story and the inside information of that business, I also want to focus on the reality of today's economy. There is so much noise about this inevitable recession that we find ourselves in right now. And where it's going to go, is it really having an impact on the recruitment sector? Are they seeing any change in job flow? Are they seeing any change in candidate control or activity? What is going on? I want to find out. So every single week, I want to forget the propaganda, forget the noise. I'm going to speak to a real life recruitment owner and find out what is going on in their business. I will bring it to you every single Wednesday from 12 o'clock across multiple platforms. Stay tuned. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the RAG podcast on this week's show. I am joined by Jonathan Field, who is the co-CEO of SSQ. SSQ is a niche legal search firm with over 100 staff across 11 offices all over the globe. Headquartered in London, they've got offices in Europe, Asia, and they've just opened up in the US. I absolutely loved this episode because Jonathan spoke about things I honestly don't think I've ever covered. We talked about his journey from leaving a law firm, Alan, o Alan and Overy, after two years as a practicing lawyer, to join the recruitment industry and then working his way up to CEO. But we talked about the, the legal recruitment sector, the high profit nature, and the way in which they've ran their business. So we covered a number of things. Number one, how do they maintain profit margins over 30%? with over 100 people, which is incredible. Number two, we talked about how every single person in their business, apart from pure back office uh, individuals, are, have a fee-earning responsibility. Even Jonathan, as co-CEO, has a 50% of the time he's got a fee-earning responsibility. So there's no fat, there's no management layers and, and bureaucracy. Everyone is driven by um, owning the business and driving the business and and, and generating fees. And then we talked about number three was the um, employee ownership trust. So last year, they sold 100% of the business to an employee owned trust, which effectively means that everyone in the business owns the company and will make incredible rewards from this structure. So scaling to 100 people, 30% profit without overly ridiculous management structures, and then an amazing exit ownership strategy that I've never heard about before. In this episode, we're going to cover it all, and you're going to learn so much from one of the most well-spoken, smart founders I've ever worked with. Without further ado, Jonathan, welcome to the RAG podcast. Thank you for having me. Pleasure to be here. Oh, pleasure. We've just been spending the first 15 minutes of our chat about Man City and Arsenal. So we might uh, we might end up back there at some point during the show, I think. Possibly, possibly. I should start by saying I'm a big fan of the pod. And I mentioned this to you previously, but I think it's like quite a nice little introduction. So I quite, I'm quite into podcasts. I'm like, uh, I listen to quite a few of them. Uh, and I tend to listen to them at night. Right. So I'll go to bed. Oh, you told <laughs> And I often fall asleep listening to a podcast. And I don't know if you know this, but when you're listening to a podcast on Apple, on your phone, if you fall asleep, it doesn't just stop at the end of the podcast. It will just play the whole back catalogue of the episodes on your phone. Yeah. So even though you and I only started chatting a couple of weeks ago, very often <laughs> I'll wake up in the middle of the night just hearing you chat to a recruitment owner. <laughs> yeah. So it's a pleasure to finally be uh, to be on the pod. Mm -hmm. You 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 uh, you kind of you haunt my dreams, Sean. Amazing. Love it. Well, pleasure to have you on. If what's gonna happen is in about a year's time when I've done loads of episodes, you're gonna fall asleep and you're gonna wake up listening to yourself. That's gonna be weird. <laughs> That's gonna happen. I like, apologize to anyone who wakes up in the middle of the night and hears me in their um, in their bedroom. Yeah. Do you know what I remember being a kid and I used to put the radio on in the night. I used to listen to yeah. a guy called James Stanich on Key 103 in Manchester, and um, he was really funny. And and in the night, then you'd get all sorts of crap. And I remember when Harry Kuehl signed for Liverpool. 
I was, I dreamt, I thought I dreamt it. I was convinced that when I saw it the next day, I was like, I dreamt that. I was like, I dreamt that happened. And I remember going to school telling everyone, and then I realized I just listened to the news in the night. So I, I just, the news every hour, the bulletin, someone told, yeah. he told me he'd signed for, for it. So I was like, I'm not dreaming any of this stuff. I'm just listening to the radio in the night. So You're very good at this because you actually sound like quite, and that you could be a radio host. Like, that was what I wanted to do. Really? Okay, yeah. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, years that. ago, yeah. I used to go to school and not want to get out of the car because I'd say, like, I want to, I'd love to just do that. It sounds well better than going to school. But then I never actually went into, I never went to any formal training or anything that, you know, I've got a mate who works for, he works in the radio. He's really high up. He produces some, some of the best shows on BBC. And he was running the like Sheffield Hallam FM radio station at uni. And, you know, he properly studied it. Story of my life, really. It's probably why I ended up in recruitment because yeah. I, uh, yep. I it didn't. It seems to work out okay for you, Sean. Done all right. We've done all right. So yeah. anyway, John, I did you, Jonathan, I did you a brief introduction, but um, do me a favor. For the, for the listener's benefit, give us an overview, a bird's eye view of you and SSQ right now, and then we'll go back and tell the story. Okay, so SSQ, we are um, a legal search business. So we're focused exclusively on legal, an inch wide and a mile deep, as the saying goes. Yeah. So the business was set up 20 years ago. It was our 20th anniversary this year. And today we are just over 100 people with 11 offices. So we're headquartered in London but we have offices across Europe, the Middle East and Asia. And they've actually just launched our first office in the US, in New York. Um, And I would say outside of the US, we have built what we think is one of the leading legal search businesses. Um, So yeah, that is us. And I've been, yeah, so I've been with the business. I didn't didn't set the business up, so I joined it five years in and so i've been with the business for 15 years and i've been doing the ceo job since 2019 so where are we coming up to five years yeah amazing so you you stood i know you studied as a as a lawyer right you went through through yeah. legal training yeah so <clears throat> i finished uni and i didn't really know what to do like lots of people I had no clue yeah. and so i just thought okay I'll, why don't i go and be a lawyer did you not do law at uni? I didn't do law at uni, no. <laughs> I did international relations. I just like picked a right. course with like, the least number of hours. Yeah. And it got to the end of the degree and I thought, what do I do? I had no clue. I think my mum had always talked about me being a lawyer. No idea why. And so I just sent off loads of applications to law firms. And weirdly, and I still don't understand how this happened, I ended up getting what is it like they give out training contracts so you apply at university say i want to be a lawyer and if they like you they will pay for you to go through law school and then give you a job at the end right and somehow i landed a training contract with one of the biggest law firms in the country it's a firm called allen and overy yeah 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 and i'm still not quite sure how that happened i didn't like have amazing grades at school at uni i did okay but it, it wasn't i wasn't stand out so i'm not quite sure how that happened so i went to law school I did two years of law school and then you do a two year training contract. So I joined this big law firm in 2005 yep. uh, and did a training contract and then qualified. And so I was there for just under three years. Um, but truth is I was useless, like really bad. <laughs> like just an awful lawyer. So one of those things, I mean, <clears throat> not that anyone needs me to tell them this, but it's a good reminder. Um, I just slept walked into trying to be a lawyer without giving yeah. any thought as to what am I good at? Like, what are my skills? And if you had to layer my, put together side by side, my skills and what it takes to be a good lawyer. Yeah, I mean, I am a total mismatch. Everything I enjoy doing and I'm good at is not what a lawyer is good at. So um, can you give us a breakdown really high level of what that is? What are those, what are the differences there? <laughs> That's a good question. So lawyers, at its core, you need to be really interested in the intricacies and details of stuff. Like what law actually is, is like documenting the mechanics of deals. Mm. And so you have to be someone who I think likes understanding the details and mechanics of stuff. And that is your real strong suit. Um, 
And I think most recruiters would say that if they were looking look at their skill set, that isn't really what they like doing. Yeah. Um, now, there's a ton of other stuff that goes into being a really good lawyer. But at its core, you have to be good at that. You have to like details and mechanics and machinery of documents and deals and all that sort of stuff. So I joined this law firm and it was like a brutal experience because they work incredibly long hours. So I joined this law firm and it was like just very common for me to be in the office through to like midnight or 1am. Yeah. Yeah. You'd be part of like a team of like 15 or 20 people working on, I was a finance lawyer, so I was in the banking team. So our job was to advise banks and borrowers on these big like billion dollar facilities and what have you. And so these deals would like, they would crucify their teams. You know, you'd be there till like 12, 1am. And so- What would you be was, doing? Just reading through paperwork and stuff? Then? Yeah, I mean, effectively, when you're trying to get deals done, when it gets to like the last couple of weeks of a deal, there's arbitrary deadlines that people have to meet. And so you're you're basically trading documents back and forth over the lawyers, trying to negotiate all these different points, all with a view to it being closed by a certain date. So if you get comments back from the other side at like 7 p.m. and your client wants to have a call the next morning, you're going to have to go through all those documents, you know, you have to go through it all. So, and law firms also, certainly back then, I think less so now, had a culture where if you were good and you wanted to succeed as a lawyer, then you were working hard. Like if there, there have to be a reason why you weren't putting in the hours. And so not only was I not very good at it, I was just, I was working all hours. That, that combination is miserable. If you're trying to do something endlessly and you're not very good at it it wasn't work the one thing I did I was good at which was a precursor to going into recruitment is um I was good with clients mm. and what tended to be the case is everyone else I was training with or even the junior lawyers they were brilliant at the job going through documents being very detailed working incredibly hard there weren't so many people there who just took to the client stuff fluently so yeah. I was like the I was like the inverse of all these lawyers there. Yeah. That became apparent quite quickly. I remember my supervising lawyer said to me, like, you have like supervising partners. And after about three or four months, he did say to me, like, this is this is proving a bit of a struggle here. He said, but you're really good with the clients. And that's when I began to think, okay, like I'm gonna need to find something that I enjoy. And mostly people enjoy what they're good at. Yeah. Uh, and so I, after about I was there for I trained for two years and then qualified and practiced for about seven months and and seven months in I was like okay I've got to go um and it was actually quite a big deal like um looking now it doesn't seem so but at the time it was I had spent two years at law school and then two years at this law firm it was all very prestigious you know I got to like say I, I'm a lawyer at this law firm like my parents thought it was the greatest thing ever. There was all this like kudos, like prestige and esteem. Uh, and in hindsight, like I shouldn't have wasted seven months being there, but at the time it felt like a huge move. Um, I was recently, I just got married. We had a kid on the way. And How old are you at this point then? I was 27, 26, 27. So you got a lot. You got a lot on your plate then for someone relatively young. You know, you're married, get yeah. on the way. You're not. Yeah. You're not. You know. You know me. I was 26 when I moved to London and got into recruitment yeah. in London, and you know, I was. Yeah, I was very young in in reality compared to you when it comes to responsibilities. All all I had was a a night out in Clapham to pay for every week. That was bad. <laughs> pressures <laughs> and pressures, whatever they are at the time. Um, yeah. So I. Uh, it did feel like quite a big move when I when I said to my family, look, I'm going to leave this big prestigious law firm and go into recruitment, there were some questions. How did you to... find that or make that decision? Did you go out to speak to recruiters regarding opportunities and they then, you identified that was the kind of job you wanted or like, how did it? You know what? I hadn't actually thought about recruitment at all. I was like a typical lawyer. I, I, at the time, I was probably quite snobby about recruitment. Mm. I thought this isn't yeah. for me. Like, fine, I'm not going to be a lawyer, but I'm not going to be a recruiter. Yeah. And <laughs> I can't remember how it happened. I think I went on a friend's party or friend's stag do. And there was a guy there who, who ran a recruitment business, very successful. Um, they do trading recruitment in the city. The guy there who runs it is a business called the Options Group. Right. You'd like him, actually. I should connect you with him, the guy who runs yeah, that business. Um, 
uh, and, and we, were, we were on the stag do. And at the end of it, he said to me, do you, I think you'd be quite good at recruitment. Do you want to come and work for me? And it was the first time anyone had planted a seed. And I was thinking, okay, this is interesting. Now, he was saying, come and set up a legal desk for me. Now, I'd never recruited a day in my life. So I thought that's just a bit, that's a stretch. And so at that point, I started to talk to the various legal recruitment businesses in London. And, and I'm, truth be told, um, I must have met three or four businesses. And most of them played into the stereotypes I had of recruiters. So I kind of knew, okay, I think I could be good at this. But the people I was meeting, I wasn't, I was thinking, okay, I'm not sure I want to get into business with these people. And so, but the people who set up SSQ had effectively had the same career story that I had. They had all been lawyers at top law firms. One of them had been at the firm I was at and they had left to set up what was then SSQ. And they built, even in the first few years, had built reputation as being right at the top end of the business. And I met with them and I was like blown away. I was like, okay, here's super high quality people that I can learn from and I can get on board with. So when I met them, I was like, okay, this is something I can jump into. Uh, so yeah, that was 2000, early 2007. Um, I jumped into recruitment just as the- Amazing. Went. I mean, it reminds me of when I, when I came back to London. So I'd done a- just under two years at, in at Randstad in Australia, and then I'm 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 in I'm in Melbourne, and I'm interviewing to come back to London. And I, I got one rec to rec who got me a lot of interviews, and I remember the first three or four played into everything I expected. They were they were English guys chatting yeah. about football. They yeah. all wanted to know about you know because Man City had just won the league in 2012. It wasn't yeah. the reason I left, but it was actually part of it. I was a bit like, what? Why am I on the other side of the world, and I'm not even enjoying it that much? And then. The so you had joined. You'd gone to Australia, not as a recruiter. Yeah. No, I was a school teacher who went went traveling, oh. landed in Melbourne, and I got into recruitment in because my qualification wasn't valid. So I got into recruitment in, in joined Randstad, and then did eighteen months. And when I decided to move back to the UK, I was like, I want to. I actually didn't know if I wanted to stay in recruitment, but I knew if I wanted to be a P teacher, I'd have to choose like anywhere in the country. I could might be living in like Wales or something. I was like, I want to live in London, so I'll go and I was like, I'm stick to recruitment. It was a good decision, but when I interviewed. The lady Claire Eads, who I ended up working for, was just she was the opposite. Like she was one, she went to the same university as me. We had a lot in common, but she some of the questions she asked me were incredible. And I was properly on the back foot. Whereas okay. these other guys were so like trying to build amazing rapport with me. Cause I had like yeah. I'd done a good contract book. I was I was 26 with a good contract book with no restrictive covenant, coming home, needed, you know, I was a perfect candidate. But she put me in a position where I thought. At first, I didn't like her very much. I was like, she's direct. She's, she's. Yeah, yeah. But then I, I was like, who am I going to learn from? So I chose, I chose the business I thought I was going to learn from, not the one that yeah, would yeah. be talking about football all day. And I mean, it was a, it was the right decision. They were incredible. Um, so you join SSQ. Take us back to the start. What was, what was life like for you then? It, you know, you got a lot on your plate personally. Yeah. You know, starting a new job. Yeah. To be honest, with you, it was amazing. I, I hadn't realized how much I hadn't been enjoying being a lawyer. Like I knew I didn't like it, but you normalize what working in a law firm is like. Mm. And there, so there were like some immediate benefits like that were obvious, which was, so I was used to like leaving the office at nine as a lawyer was an early night. And so just getting my life back was great, right? Like, because- Can I just uh, stop you there? So how do you get married and have a baby on the way when you're doing the loyal lawyer hours like how, how do you even maintain a relationship like what yes, that must very be very possible super difficult you have to make compromises like people who want to make their way through a law firm have to make huge compromises it's really really difficult i think now yeah. it's slightly easier like back then the idea that you do any work from home impossible so yeah. i think now lawyers have much more flexibility and people don't mind working hard as long as you've got some flex so i think it's yeah. easier today back then really was challenging it was really really hard and that's i just look, looked at that and thought this isn't sustainable not for me anyway hmm. uh, so like just getting my life back was great but also the thing that was the biggest difference so law firms are amazing businesses but they're very hierarchical and the one thing that they don't have is a direct correlation between input and output you know effectively hmm. you get paid the same amount of money as everyone else at your stage. So year one, you get paid this, year two, you get paid that, year three, you get paid that. And you can work as many hours as you like, you'll still get paid the same amount of money. It's changed a little bit now, they're better at bonusing. But to go into an environment where input and output is so directly correlated, I loved it. 
absolutely loved it. So I knew that the harder I worked, the more deals I tried to do, the more successful I would be. I needed that immediate bit of feedback. So A, just kind of not having to work as hard. Although I must say, training in a law firm put some work ethic in me, which I think really helped. Because, you know, if I was working till seven, eight o'clock at night, every night, it felt like an early night to me. But I was mm -hmm. probably out working the competition, even working those hours. The input and output was amazing. And doing something that I was good at, that was the biggest change. Like all of a sudden, I just felt every day, okay, I'm good at this. I can do it. And it, it just changes everything. So it was it was brilliant. I just loved it. I knew very quickly I found what, I, what, I'm, gonna, what I'm going to do. Mm. Um, the only challenge was is that it was 2007, so the world was about to collapse. So that, that, that put some complications in there. But other, other than that, it was just great. I loved it. I wanted to quickly interrupt this episode to update you on what it is I actually do all day, apart from the RAG podcast, of course. Now, most of you know from the episodes that I am the founder of Hoxo, right? What you probably don't know is that we're currently working with over 250 recruitment agencies and over 4,000 of their recruiters around the world in every continent and helping these businesses brand themselves and the people in the company better. Now, we have built a creative team over the last six years that helps manage the creation of new agency brands. Obviously, the, a lot of the listeners in the RAG are starting their businesses uh, for the first time. But more often than not, we rebrand tired companies. So many businesses we work with are smashing it when it comes to revenue and performance, but their website and their online story was built back when they started for like 500 quid and it just does not represent who they are today. So we believe getting that right becomes your, building a brand becomes your anchor. Now, every good brand also needs traffic, right? You need people to see it, to come to the website, see you online, and that's where your people come in. So we work to either manage the personal brands of your team, or we can teach you how to build the brand yourselves. All of it is designed to give you consistency on LinkedIn that helps you stand out from the competition, show your personality, show and add value, and ultimately make more money. Now, I personally speak to potential new customers along with my business partner, Amma. So I would love to spend some time with you, my RAG listeners that I potentially don't even know yet. Any of you that are interested in building a brand that's fit for purpose in 2023 and beyond, come and speak to us. Just click the link in the show notes, fill in the form, and we will be in touch with you within 48 hours to book a 30 minutes video call ASAP. Right, back to the show. What did the business look like back then? So when you joined, you know, it's five years old. Yeah. How big was it? How many people? So it was, I can't remember exact numbers. I, I'm guessing here, but I think it was like 25 to 30 people. Right. There was, we had, there was a London office and there was a Munich office and there was, I think there was Spain, there was a few international offices. We hadn't done Asia yet. We hadn't done the Middle East yet. We definitely hadn't done the US. But it was still a, a relatively, first of all, it was a successful business. It hadn't been going that long, but it was being successful. And from day one, they, they launched London and Germany simultaneously. So it was already quite international. Uh, so, yeah, it felt like I, I wasn't walking into something totally greenfield. Also, I yeah. should say, the guys, and we can come on to this because it kind of goes to our story a little bit. So the guys, two people set up our business originally and they had previously worked in what was like the first dedicated legal recruitment business in London. There's a business called Quarry Dougal. Now that business sold in like early 2000s, huge exit. Uh, and so they then span out and set this up. And so when they set this business up, those guys have been in the recruitment business, in the legal recruitment business for, I don't know, 10 years prior and already built yeah. a reputation for being amongst the best. So even though the business was quite young, the people who were running it had, they were, they were right at the top of the market. Yeah. So you chose well. And what, when you say you, 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 you knew you were good at it or you felt like you were good at it, what do you think you were good at specifically? Obviously you had, you had industry domain knowledge that, that helps, yeah. but what parts of the role do you think you quickly took to so i like the sales part as i said i, I kind of i'm motivated you know, i think you know in recruitment you know very quickly whether someone's motivated as a salesperson hmm. so actually when i look across our business now being a lawyer is not 
absolutely necessary to be successful with us? We get asked that question quite a lot. When we're looking to hire talent, people say, well, do you have to be a lawyer? Now it helps, it does help. But if I was to say, okay, here are the two or three things that are absolute kind of red lines or they're fundamental or they're kind of, we have to have them in place to be successful. Being a lawyer wouldn't actually be on the list. It does help in certain instances, but it's not determinative as to how successful we're going to be. Um, so the sales bit, I just, I, I knew it, I liked it, it motivated me. Um, and I was interested. So like, I think um, your ability to kind of take on information, digest it, synthesize it, and then regurgitate it out, that's like quite a fundamental skill, I think, in recruitment. And so yeah. I, I, I was able to use that bit. I was good at that. I was good at that. Yeah, I think I was, that was, like, that was that, I'd say the same, actually. That was something I was good at. And I was, I was, I think I was good at putting two people in a room before they were in the room. Like I could genuinely imagine two people in a room and, and kind of work out the nuances of how the conversation might go. Okay. And, and I think I was doing that before the job. So the amount of people I put in touch with football teams and okay. just put friendship groups together and stuff, I kind of naturally always brought people together and thought, you, you like that it. A little bit, yeah. Not necessarily like romantic relationships, but like just... Yeah why don't you two know each other kind of thing? Like, you, you know, okay. you're so similar and you, you see the yeah, world yeah. a similar way. I remember putting a lot of groups together. So when it kind of, yeah, when that, that was something about the job I, I think I took to and, and listening and digesting and, and my memory was strong. My memory was yeah. so strong. I, I could, even now, I can remember the placement names of people I made in 20, 2010 or something. I can remember it. Like, it's not, okay. it's not a challenge. My older brother's a little bit like Rain Man, and he works for Oliver James in, in Manchester, right? And the, the, okay. the, the CRM went down. The CRM went okay. down. And he's still phoning candidates. And I mean mobile yeah. numbers. And they're like, and they're not in his phone. He just knows them. He okay. can picture things like that. I'm like, he's like Mike Ross in suits. Um, <laughs> what a, quick question. What impact does that have on like the legal recruitment space? Like the TV shows like that. Do people get into it? Do the recruiters think like, that's what it's all about like yeah. it, is there a bit of like glamour around it yeah i think a lot of people go into law because they still watch tv shows like when i was growing yeah. up it was the equivalent of suits you can make a series about being a lawyer seem dramatic and particularly yeah. american tv shows so i just i think a lot of the time people stumble into law because they think they're going to be on suits exactly that they won't admit that yeah. and if you're a lawyer in a law firm today it couldn't be anything less like being in suits so i think <laughs> Like people do they, there's some glamour of being a law of being a lawyer also in the states in the u.s in particular and the u.s drives the legal market globally mm. um they they also like the role of a lawyer in the u.s is much more prominent than in the uk so if you look at politicians in the u.s a lot of them train as lawyers if you look right. at people ceos of top businesses again a much larger amount of running top companies if they've trained as being a lawyer it's a more prestigious, more kind of sexy role in the US. And yeah. so that filters into media, it filters into TV and film. And so I think that does impact people. Then they join a law firm in London, they get a big smack in the face because they realise they're not Mike Ross <laughs> and they're not Harvey and it doesn't actually work anything like that. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so, yeah. But yeah, you're right. It does, it does impact. I bet. So how did your career grow? Tell us through. You come in, you figure out you like it. Yeah. What was a, your trajectory like, especially with the global financial crisis on the horizon as well? Yeah, so um, we do two. I should probably unpack the legal space for you a little bit because it helps explain what I do. So um, I think law is quite poorly understood in the recruitment world. So the first thing to say is like law firms themselves, they're not publicly traded businesses. They're partnerships. But if they were publicly traded companies, they would be worth billions and billions of pounds, billions. Their market cap, if you look at what profit law firms generate and you just apply a multiple and look at how publicly traded companies are valued, law firms are some of the most valuable businesses in the world. Mm. But because they're not publicly traded and because they're not sold and bought, I think it, people miss just how successful these businesses are. So if you take our top, 50 or 60 law firm clients in particular, all I'm just, I'm making this up a little bit, but I'm just to make the point, I think almost all of them would be worth, they'd all be unicorns. They'd all be worth like billions and billions of pounds. And so um, that makes it as a sector, extremely lucrative from a recruitment point of view, because there's 
kind of two parts to what we do, well, there's three parts to what we do, but just as a sector, these businesses are incredibly profitable. A lot of them are headquartered in London, but if not, they will have centers in London and say like, it's a very valuable market. Um, And so in law firm in particular, we do two things. We help them hire associates. So you join a law firm as a newly qualified lawyer and you spend your time as like an associate for eight or nine years. And that market is very liquid, but it's also very valuable. And again, I'm going to make another generalization here, but it just illustrates my point. I think you can have recruitment businesses that are kind of, there's two types. There's the kind of the volume players where your business is to do tons of placements and you kind of accept that the value of those placements is capped out at a certain level. Yeah. And then there are research businesses, Hydric and Spencer Stewart, where mm. the value of those placements are super high, but you just do less volume. Yeah. So the interesting thing about law is you can you can transact at value. So the, like super high value deals, but at volume as well. And so what what happened with me was I started off doing associate recruitment, which is like placing one years, two years, three years, four years, five years, kind of qualified lawyers. And you can make really good money and be super successful and it's a really good business. And then what happens is you kind of migrate into doing partner recruitment. Right. And so and this is what has been the kind of the engine room of our business. And it's like the secret source of the kind of how we've achieved what we've achieved. So um, law firms don't have shareholders and they tend not to reinvest their money into kind of capital expenditure like other businesses. What happens is the profits of law firms just get distributed out to the partners every year. So the partners in law firms make a lot of money. You know, you're talking about anything from like half a million dollars, a million dollars, all the way through to like 10, 15 million dollars. Right. So it's an extremely lucrative business to be in if you're a partner in a law firm. But the thing that makes it interesting from a recruitment point of view is that there are thousands of these partners. Law firms have thousands of partners. And that market is, again, it's liquid. So the number of moves that happen of partners moving from one law firm to the other, you kind of get the best of both worlds. You get the volume of a traditional recruitment business multiplied by the value of like what would typically be a search business. So like if you're working at Spencer Stewart or Hydric or any of these businesses, you may get to recruit, you know, how many CEOs or CFOs or chief marketing officers can you recruit in any given year? Yeah. Each business only needs one. Whereas some of our clients will recruit 30, 40 or 50 partners each year. Wow. So I started off doing associate stuff, but then quickly pivoted into doing partner recruitment. And that has been the engine of our business uh, for the last 10 years. Um, wow. And it helps us in a bundle of different ways, which we can come on to talk about. Um, we, we benefited in particular um, over the last 10 years. What has happened in the legal space is a little bit like what's happened in the investment banking space a decade before American law firms have expanded globally over the last 10 or 15 years. And so they've recruited tons of lawyers, partners and associates in all of the places where we have offices, London, Paris, Munich, Frankfurt, Düsseldorf, Dubai, Hong Kong, Beijing, Shanghai. And so we have ridden the wave. We, it, like We're in the right place at the right time. We've been at this in a moment where law firms have effectively been expanding globally we have been one of the businesses that have helped us law firms in particular expand across the world. And so that, that's what I pivoted into quite quickly. I went from doing kind of junior level recruitment into doing senior level recruitment. Like within, I joined in 2007, by 2010, I was mainly focused on doing partner and senior level work for law firms. And what are the average deal values in both, both camps? Very different today than it was when I started, but today yeah. uh, it does vary law firm to law firm. But you know, to, to, as an average, like newly qualified lawyers in some of our uh, clients, they're earning you know one hundred fifty thousand, one hundred seventy five thousand, and then it just trends up. You know, you're, that's year one, and then two hundred thousand, two hundred thirty, two hundred forty, two hundred fifty, and and. It, it keeps going up through to about, you know, 300,000 pounds. So that's this is the associate. Is this the associate, Mark? Yeah, this is associates, yeah. Wow. Well, I can so you're talking about what? 
20, 30, 40 grand fees, 50 grand fees, even in that space. Yeah, it's very high value legal. I can hear my partner saying, like, why are you saying all this? Like, after this podcast, I'm going to have everyone <laughs> saying, I'll be But yeah, I mean, like, we, we're, we're, it's very high value and we're transacting a volume. So, like, you know, we'll do, in a good year, we'll do, you know, seven or 800 placements globally. Wow. And a big chunk of that is associates for law firms at that deal value. So, yeah, like, the guys who are doing associate recruitment for us, when the market is buoyant, the billings can be really big. Like um, in 2021, which was like the blowout year for most recruitment businesses, I think we had not just associate recruiters, but people across the business. I think we had 13 or 14 million dollar plus billers across the business. Wow. Um, so yeah, it, it's very, 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 very valuable. Once you move into the partner stuff, then the value jumps again. So, you know, again, it depends on the law firm, but it's not uncommon for partners and law firms to start uh, start at like three or $400,000 and go through to, you know, it can be the tens of millions. Um, and so again, we are, that market is liquid um, and we will be doing, you know, of that six or 700 placements, you know, you, over a hundred are partner moves each year. Um, and that it, it's, it's, it's great for a number of reasons. Like the first is it's very valuable, right? So the fees are large. Um, and so law is a lucrative area in which to do recruitment. Yeah. That's super important for keeping people. Like I think one of the biggest issues any recruitment CEO or owner faces is how do you keep your talent? Yeah, especially a- when they reach a certain level, like when they reach a certain standard. Yeah, it's, it's super difficult. And, and broadly, I think that people tend to leave. I think re- when we've looked at recruiters from other businesses, I think they leave for like two or three reasons. The first one is just bad management. That's got nothing to do with the sector. You just got to try and make sure you're managing people well. But the, the, the second and third, you can mitigate if you've got the right business. So the second reason people leave is just economics. You reach yeah. a ceiling and you think, okay, if I want to earn more, I'm going to have to either join another business or set up on my own. So the reason we've been able to keep people, so some of the people in our business have been with us for 15 or 20 years, some people longer than me. Uh, and the reason for that is that the, the there's always headroom, there's always runway. So there's no real cap on what you can earn. I mean, ultimately, there is some sort of overall cap, but you know, they, they, there's never there doesn't really come a point where people look at it and say, well, like, I can't really earn much more because the value is so high. So we've been able to keep talent because they don't really have an economic reason to move on. And then the second is autonomy. I think we've been religious about not putting in a kind of full-time layer of management in the business. I think once you do that, you do a couple of things. Number one is you make it much more difficult to keep your margins high because you've got a ton of people that aren't really recruiting. And you make it very hierarchical such that, people feel they want to leave. So in our business, from me all the way down, apart from the people who are doing, you know, IT and finance and and effectively support operations and infrastructure, everyone in our business fee earns. So it's a bit, you're running it more like a law firm then, in the way that all the partners and everyone's like still producing, still, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I guess that's You're in your industry almost more than some of the others in, in the recruitment space. Yeah, I hadn't really thought about it like that. Yeah, I guess we are to some extent. Yeah. So you think about it, there is, those, these partners all just, they, they they develop their careers, but they're still industry leaders. They're still being paid, you know, almost like bonuses and dividends. And they're, they're not bogged down in management all day, a lot of these people. No. And it sounds it's interesting. Like, like you, you look at, um, when you look at uh, what's going on in America, particularly in the tech space, you know, like Elon Musk bought Twitter and like uh, he like immediately fired like thousands of people, thousands of people. And one of the big takeaways, particularly in Silicon Valley, was that these businesses all got just totally overinflated with layers of management. And it wasn't yeah. core to the business and it wouldn't change the product experience or the success of the company. So it, there's been this trend, particularly in the technology sector, of people just getting rid of thousands of people because they've become bloated. And I think it's like a really good lesson for anyone in business, but particularly in recruitment. People should have a you know a big long hard look at the business and say okay, if someone is just 
managing full time, how many people like that do you have across the business? And to the extent they weren't there, what would happen? What would happen in terms of delivery to clients and people's ability to bill? And my sense is, is that some businesses go too far in like uh, having just layers and layers of people who are managing or managing or managing or managing. Um, and look, maybe we don't have it right, but we've been quite religious in making sure that we don't have those full time managers. Everyone in the business fee earns. I still today, 50 percent of my time is spent fee earning. Um, and that allows you to be non hierarchical. And also we've been we allow people to have a lot of autonomy. So I think if you give people huge runway on economics and you give them huge autonomy, it goes a long way to keeping people within the business. You, I mean, we're not perfect. We've lost people, but it helps. But if you think about most recruitment firms, you get, you know, someone does really well. They then, rec- they bill a lot. Even even myself, you know, I wasn't in the same league as some of your guys, but when you're building seven, over 700,000, you're earning good money. You, you know, I, I literally could see my bosses going, you're a key man risk. You know, yeah. and so it's like, how do we get people around you? How do we split up what you're doing? And yeah. so that, and I did eventually leave. But I, I mean, I do remember a conversation as well, and they probably won't even remind me saying this, but I remember them telling me they wanted me to get to 400 contractors. Right. And I was, I was running about oh, 80, 88 when I left as a team. So I probably, probably got, I was probably on about 50 at the time. Like, we want you at 400. And I was like, okay. I remember saying, what's in it for me? And he almost got a bit offended, my boss. He was like, what's yeah. in it for you? Yeah. I was like, well, why am I doing this? Like, yeah. I could see what's in it for you, but what's in it for me? And it felt, it did feel very weighted to that it was, it was all about their business. Like, if, again, economically, if you'd have gone, you're going to earn a million yeah. quid a year, or you, you could have yeah. easily got me excited by it, about my yeah. part in that, but it, it wasn't. It was, it was about the, the business growth. And I was just a bit, yeah, I was a bit... Bit, bit put off, if I'm honest. Yeah, um, I, I understand it. It's, like, it's very difficult. I mean, I think it's one of the biggest conundrums owners and CEOs face. How do you incentivize people? Uh, and you're always, it's that balance between keeping the business as profitable as it could be and incentivizing people. We always, and this is something I picked up, you know, from the people who ran the business before me. We've always been, um, we've always tried to make sure that when people are running business units or teams, that they are earning, you know, above the line and below the line. And I think you have to be able to show people that, particularly if you want to keep people for a long period. Mm. Um, and so that's important. You've got to come up with a really good incentive. So if, you, if you're going to say to people, right, we want you to keep on fee earning, but also manage, you have to reward people for everything. And then we sold the business a couple of years ago to an employee ownership trust. And I'm sure we can come on to talk about that. But prior to that, we had... 15 or 16 shareholders in the business and by shareholders i mean real shareholders what i see a lot of when we we interview people from other agencies is people are given share options and and schemes the whole time and when you unpick them they don't really mean anything year to year Mm. really what they mean is if we ever sell the business you'll get a little bit and recruitment companies are very very difficult to scale and very very difficult to build value in and incredibly difficult to exit I think there is a unhealthy obsession with exit in our yeah. industry. We can come on to talk about that. Um, I think there's an unhealthy obsession with exit in general. Like, yeah, because it tends yeah. to me. It means you know, we spoke about this a lot in our business, and it's like we fucking love the business. Like, yeah. we, we enjoy it. It's like, you know, if if I was just building something to get out of it, I'm like, well, what am I going to do next? Like, you know, you you got to be really excited about something else to want to get out. I, I think I think there's an unhealthy obsession in general with exit, but. That is a se- that's, separate conversation. It, no, it, listen, it's a great observation. And we can talk a little bit about our process, if you want, of the of how, what we decided to do. But um, we should come on to this. Um, we, as our business got more successful, um, we, um, we started getting approaches. So what, what, what we found is we've always done very well. Like the recruiter magazine run this thing called the Hot 100. I don't know if you've seen yeah, it. Yeah, so well, yeah. Well, that's, ranks- why, that's why you're on this show. Oh, really? Because, okay. Yeah, because you were published in that and we've reached out to a number of people okay. in that show. There you go. In that list, right? right? So, yeah, so that, that list ranks recruiting businesses by um, gross profit per head. So yeah. they feel like that's the purest form of like success and they produce this league table. Now, we've always done really well in that. We've always been like, the top three or four. Hmm. And so what tends to happen is that if you are in corporate finance, 
and it, your your business is to try and like make money by buying and selling recruitment businesses like business development 101 is go through that list a bit like mm. you guys have done right so, right mm. so as we started getting more successful in that list we, we were approached regularly particularly by private equity to try and engineer conversations we managed to scale the business to a point where it was actually it had value quite hard to do and we can come back to talk about that but we had some conversations over the years and we got quite close a couple of times and particularly with private equity when we got when we were getting to a point where it looked like we may have a deal um, happening I would I would go out and talk to people who had sold their businesses some recruitment some not particularly those that done it with private equity and the amazing thing about that is and again this is just anecdotal like I've not spoken to a thousand sellers no but I've spoken to a decent number and from the conversations I had, 50-50 at best is the um, is the feedback that it, I was really pleased I did it. Like 50-50. Mm. And I think I'm being generous there. I would actually say it's probably 60-40 the other way. Yeah. At least half of the people I spoke to that had sold their businesses to private equity or to trade in some way regretted it. Now, that is like a really high number as a piece of feedback if you're going to make a decision like that. Like if, if yeah. half the people who've done it say they regret doing it, need to think really long and hard and what you just said is the is the is the bit of feedback that comes back the most yes there was some money made but particularly if you're if you've got 15 or 20 years ahead of you they were all left like a year or two later unhappy with what was going on in their business or struggling to find something to do so your, your your observation is totally right you're right to think about it in that way i mean look don't get me wrong people should be able to crystallize value and make money i'd never begrudge that but it, i i just i think everyone thinks it's like the old it's the garden of eden and if you can just sell your business everything's okay and you speak to people who've done it and and half of them say i regret we i regret doing it but he but you also got to work out like to 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 be in a position to to have an event that does create a certain amount of income that is life-changing you've got to your business has got to be in pretty amazing shape anyway so you're probably yeah. making a certain amount of ebit that like i don't know it depends on your on your on your lifestyle but my lifestyle yeah. choices i always talk about this me and me and Al, the reason we change our strategy about a year ago, we we have a lot a coach that a guy called Aria who was on my who was on the show, and um, you probably heard him in the middle of the night at some point. Anyway, because um, <laughs> he, he said to me and I'm like, what well, you know, what do you want from this? And um, we came up with an I came up with an arbitrary number, you know, seven figure number, multiple seven figure number, not in, not an eight figure number. And um, he said, all right, well let's talk about what what you're going to do with it like what, what yeah. do you want it for so, so i painted a picture of my future yeah he started laughing his head off and this is a guy who never judges most incredible listener i've ever ever met in my life um kind warm he, he doesn't laugh at you like it's just not his, his yeah. but he starts laughing and i said i had to stop and i said what are you laughing at he goes i did not expect that response from you so i said well what did you expect he goes well i'm still waiting for the bit where you need the money yeah. And what he said was like, my, my expectations are so basic, so humble. I basically, I've got it already. Like everything I want, I've already got. So I'm like, yeah. I don't have, a, I don't want to fly a jet or buy, invest in Man City or like, I don't want these ridiculously yeah. expensive living things. So we like, look, and, and again, interview, I've done 260 odd episodes of this and met so many founders who've exited and it, it I guess it all impacts on me as I'm listening. So, uh, I, I completely agree with it. I don't yeah. want to take it all, turn it all about me, by the way. Um, in this terms is... of, I want to go back on a couple of things you've said because yeah. there's a journey to this show, but yeah. you've mentioned a few things. What I reckon, if I'm if I'm a listener now, based on your lack of structure and hierarchy and leadership levels, tell us what that looks like. Because I'm thinking, if I, you know, I'm inspired yeah. by you, but I, I can't really picture it because what we know, we know, we normally get a consultant, becomes senior, becomes team lead, becomes a manager. Yeah build from that you have directors above them it's it's a classic structure in a recruitment firm so what yeah. how does it work for you and how do you keep people yeah. on track without yeah. without the layers of red tape so i've probably oversimplified it so it, it, <laughs> we we do have <laughs> we do have a hierarchy right so we do have titles and roles I, there are some recruitment businesses that don't right and i i'm in, in, in admiration of them this is like one job title that that's in its purest form so like we we have roles and titles and you can get promoted, but broadly um, we've got, I think it's like 11 or 12 business units. 
And each business unit has whatever it is. Some have like eight or nine fee earners, some have three or four, and each of them will have a business unit head. Some of our business units have two business unit heads. <clears throat> And broadly, those, those business unit heads are still fee earning. They're still seeing clients. They're still generating NFI. But they also have another role, which is to oversee the PL of that particular business unit and to recruit and to drive the strategy of the individual business unit. And so all of our business unit leaders effectively act as mini business owners. They have oversight and input into PL. They are the ones that control hiring. They are the ones that control strategy all of that sort of stuff. And so, but they're fee earning at the same time. And the fee earning job that they do is not dissimilar to the fee earning job being done by the people in their team. And so that kind of allows us to have a relatively flat structure, at least culturally. It, what we don't have, and I should probably be clear about this, we don't have anyone in the business whose job it is full time to manage. And so that I think maybe. I don't know how many recruitment businesses still have that, but that's the layer that we don't have. And so you're always just working up the food chain of value in your particular business unit. And there are some people who scale that ladder very, very quickly. And some people take their time. Um, but, you know, ultimately, if you're of, if you don't want to do management in our business, you don't have to, and you can just make your way up the value food chain. The great thing about law is that, as I said, there are, you can keep jumping up the value food chain. There's, there, there doesn't come a point where you say, okay, I'm now recruiting the highest value people I can recruit. And so I'm going to need to think about doing something else. I mean, ultimately there, there is a ceiling that does exist. I just think it's pretty, it's longer in legal. And so if you've got people who are being able to generate seven figures in billings year on year on year, as long as you feel that the business structurally is going to allow you to get to that point, it's an incentive to keep going. Uh, so it's not that we don't have structure altogether. We do, but everyone is fee earning. I don't know if that answers the question. No, it does. It does. Yeah. But there's a, there was a, I mean, I remember when I went into management and there was a, it was like the Guardiola company argument. My boss actually, just, that's right. how we discussed it. He's like, at some point company, you need a Guardiola when you've got enough people, you need a Guardiola behind yeah. it. You need some job. It is completely dedicated to the team. Yeah. Who's not on the pitch? You know, you, your team leader, your your your, yeah. your your Vincent company as a captain, or your you know, yeah. Odegaard is the Arsenal captain. I think. Um, yeah. You know, we've got Gundogan. I think is our captain now. He's a yeah. silent leader. I think I love it. But um, you know, that do you not do you, do, you, do you know? Do you have an opinion on that? Is that something? That's yeah, something I see that. Um, I guess what we ask our people to do is do both, and I guess you can make a pros and cons list as to whether that works. Mm. So first of all, the management of our business. Um, so I've always done the CEO role with someone else. So <clears throat> I've been, I think if I was doing the CEO role, CEO role on my own, it'd be super difficult to fear and do the job. So we have a, we have a board, an operations board, and that board effectively runs the company. So I have a fellow CEO, a finance director, someone who's um, basically kind of has a very senior role in our European businesses. And the four of us effectively act as a committee running the business. Now, that allows each of us to carry on doing fee earning, not our finance director. He doesn't fee earn um, and do management. So we are we're big on teams kind of having a management role. You know, I think you make better decisions and it allows gives you bandwidth to do the fee earning. Um, but, yeah, I mean, effectively, what we're asking what we ask of ourselves and ask of our team leaders is to do a little bit of both. And I'm sure that you probably do sacrifice a little bit of overall contribution in terms of management by asking people to do both. But we think the upsides for the business culturally are worth it. Interrupting this show to talk about another amazing bit of content coming out of our sponsor, Vincere. They want to help you wow your clients in 2023 by uncovering tactics and power plays for high impact candidate submissions. So what they've put together is an ebook called Technify Your Client Experience Strategy. In this ebook, it will help you learn candidate driven strategies, how to offer a VIP treatment to your clients and how to leverage tech 
for high impact collaboration. The link is www.personalbrand.hoxomedia.com forward slash Vincere. The link is in the show notes, so check it out. Right, back to the show. I would, I can completely see that. I mean, I think one of the biggest challenges you have in this industry is, you know, leading by example. And when people are not doing the things you're, it's like my whole thing around content creation and building a brand, right? It will live and die at leadership because if you're asking a junior recruiter to build his brand and get on LinkedIn and be all, but then his boss is going, well, oh, I don't need to do that. Like instantly you're creating a, and, and and actually when 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 shit hits the fan and it's it's a difficult moment in that month or whatever, if if I'm a leader that's never done this, I'm probably going to tell my team to to put that to one side and focus on the core of the job. Yep. So it's you know I, I love the way you I, I think that explanation is really really powerful and and there's never a time where someone's like well he, it's easy for him to say because he's not even doing it anymore, whereas everyone's yeah. still going. Yeah. I'm, how did you get? I, let's talk about your journey to the CEO then. So how did? Because okay. you could have just you could have just carried on and, and yeah and done what you were doing. But why? Yeah. Why? How have you got to the seat you're in? Yeah. So the the, the, the kind of the founders and the major shareholders in our business, um, uh, a couple of them. So one of them at least did have a non fee earning role, so it wasn't in the business day to day. And another had like responsibility for everything else that was going on outside of the UK. And so within a relatively short period of time, this must be like, I joined in 2007. So by like 2015, I kind of had a de facto role kind of running the UK bit of our business. Um, And by that stage, my contribution was such that I'd been given material equity and I was part of the kind of board inputting into running the business. So I wasn't the CEO, but I was effectively part of like a, a group of you know the, the board that was inputting into decisions and then um we in 2018 one of our major major shareholders and founders exited the business um, and at that point the remaining major shareholder and the remaining founder asked me to become a ceo with him Which what okay. role were you in at the time so i was I was basically running our private practice business and, and effectively running the London part of the business. So I, was, I still had like a lot of people reporting into me and people reporting into them. And I'd been for a couple of years at that point contributing to discussions around the management of the business. You know, I'd, I'd begun to get familiar with PL and budgets and all of the stuff that comes with running a business, but like baby steps. And then in 2018, when we had this like reorganization, I was at that point said, okay, come and do the CEO CEO role together with me. Um, and so I, yeah, that from 2019, I started in that role. Um, so yeah, and it was actually like, it was a, that was a moment because I guess I also toyed at that point with what do I do? I'd reached a point where I was like, okay, if, if I take this role, it means X, or maybe is this the point where I go off and do something new? Because I think the one thing you can't do, I, I'd always admire people that go off and set something up on their own because they just want the personal satisfaction of knowing they've grown something totally from scratch from themselves. And although you can mitigate that and give people opportunities, I understand why some people just want to do that just for the personal satisfaction, you know, credit to you, you've Mm -hmm. done it with Hoxo. Um, And so I had a little debate in my mind at that point, you know, is this, do I want to go and do this? Uh, But ultimately I felt that, I was given being being given an amazing opportunity to run this like market leading business. As I said, I was total autonomy, and there was not much in terms of economics that was going to drive the decision, and also just clients. Like so, the interesting thing about the senior work we do is law firms in particular. They set that they can only grow by hiring in partners. So like. Technology companies, they grow by developing new bits of technology. Private yeah. equity houses, they grow by getting more assets under management. Like you could just name your industry. Law firms, they are selling units of time of their lawyers. That is their product. So yeah. when we are delivering talent to our clients, it goes above and beyond recruitment, actually. It's almost like we are supplying the raw materials that they need to do their business. Like every yeah, business. Yeah, yeah really needs good people like that obviously every business says that our most important commodities are people 
But law firms, it, it's, they really mean it, right? Like without The only way you can grow a law firm is to have more lawyers billing out more units of time. And so at the senior level, when we're moving partners, again, I'm going to make a generalization here, but just to make my point, it's almost like mini corporate finance. So when you're moving a partner to a law firm, you're not just hiring that person because you want to give them a job. What you're actually doing is you're buying their book of business. You're buying their practice. And they're able to bring that with them. Yeah. So, you know, and, and, that's important for two re- few reasons. So like if a law firm comes to us and say, okay, we want to launch a private equity practice in London. So we will go and present to that law firm, tell them all about the private equity practice in London, which lawyers act for which funds, how much money they make, how much money they generate, how much money they make, et cetera. So that bit is very advisory. And so you're going to law firms and you're advising them on their most strategic projects because for a law firm to grow, they have to, bring in practice areas. So the way they interact with us, I think is slightly different to normal recruitment. And then when you're transacting these moves, the diligence that goes into it is not dissimilar to the diligence that goes into people buying and selling businesses. So you have to understand- Well, you are, you're buying it because it is a business. It's not just the individual, is it? Exactly. So you have to understand who their clients are, what's the revenue, what's the margin, and there's like data and diligence that goes around that. And um, And so to do that, it's quite sophisticated or at least in the recruitment world, it's quite sophisticated. Um, I am mindful of my... I've come into an office today so that I can record this podcast without sound of a digger in my garden. And in the office, <laughs> there's, someone, there's someone drilling in the building. So if there's a noise in the background, guys, okay, it's okay. I can only apologise. I've tried to mitigate this and it's... Uh, I can't, I can't hear anything, so it's fine. Um, so yeah, it's good because, A, it's, it's interesting work. So I think even people who are very successful really? in recruitment... At some point, it can become a little monotonous, like you've just done it a million times. It's lucrative, but it's not interesting. So if you're doing senior work for law firms, it's actually very interesting because you're helping with strategic growth, not just hiring talent. And the advisory bit around understanding the business and preparing business plans and budgets, also advisory. And then what it also means is that you can charge your clients, in this case, the law firms, very high fees because Mm. it's not just I'm bringing you a person, it is I'm bringing you a business. And so that's what makes it super interesting and super lucrative. But what it also means is that law firms in particular are very brand sensitive to who they use to do that sort of work. It's systemically more difficult to walk out one day, set up shop and try and convince the biggest law firms in the world for their most strategic projects that they should use you because it's advisory and it's strategic and it's sophisticated. And so from a client, and also they like global offerings. Yeah. So, you know, particularly with US law firms, they'll say, okay, we want to launch a litigation practice. We want to launch an M&A practice. And we want to do that in London, Paris, Dusseldorf, Singapore. Now I can go and offer that to my clients as a one-stop shop. And I can give them comfort that we've been doing this for 20 years and we're the market leader. And so... I looked at it and thought, I'm going to compromise my ability to service the clients by trying to do this solo. Um, and I've kind of got the autonomy I need. And I, it, this isn't being driven by economics. So at that point, I was like, OK, I'm going to stay and do this. Uh, and so that's I jumped into it in 2019. Um, just before the pandemic. Just before <laughs> the pandemic. Yeah. So like uh, it was a, it was a transition, like going from being effectively full-time not quite full-time but let's say 85 percent fee earning to doing 50 50 had its challenges and made loads of mistakes um Mm. and then the first big challenge we were hit with i just started really getting involved in the management of the business around brexit so that was the first challenge and then and then the pandemic hit um so you know from stepping into management full-time we had brexit the pandemic and then Last year, we went through the process of selling the business to an employee ownership trust. So, yeah, it was—it's been very full on since I started doing the job. Let's—I'm I'm just looking at the time. We've got about 15, 10, 15 yeah. minutes. What? There's a couple of things that I really want to like. This employee-owned trust is something I want to touch on now first, yeah. because what everything you're telling me is making me realize more and more how similar the recruitment industry and the legal industry are actually i think you know because everything again whilst 
it's not quite the same by by delivering recruiters to a recruitment firm you are giving them the very product that they have like it's the same With, without growth of headcount there's only so much so far a company can go yeah. um and the way you've structured it i think is quite similar to a law firm you know the but then the way you're now looking at the, the ownership also sounds more similar to a law firm in the way that you yeah. said before, partners earning an annual dividend or whatever it is. So talk us yeah. through this, this process you've gone through, which yeah. is very different to the traditional recruitment yeah. ownership structure and sales yeah. structure. Yeah. So, yeah. So like, as I said, as we got more successful and managed to, you know, like your listeners will know, as I said, s scaling a recruitment business to the point where it has capital value is very hard really hard and there's certain things you really have to be able to kind of tick to get a, to get interest from the market mm -hmm. we we ticked quite a few of those boxes not all of them like we don't have a huge interim part of our business but we had scaled to a point in terms of like headline nfi and ebitda and number of heads and geographic spreads where people who are interested in buying would be interested in us because ultimately anyone who's looking to buy whether it's a private equity house or, or a trade purchaser they're what they're trying to work out is how risky is it to invest in this recruitment business how quickly will it dissipate so, you, know, they, they have to show some diversification so we got there what well, just said, out of interest what percentage of nfi do you guys look at as a as a as an ebit you don't have to give us exact but what's a rough guideline that that, that shows your business yeah. is in good shape we always uh, thirty percent and above is what we aim for. Yeah, which is probably so double the that's probably double the industry average. Do you know what? I got no idea. <laughs> you are um, you're talking between ten and fifteen percent as an okay. industry, and that's a really high end industry average. Right. So we it, we are helped by the fact that we do so much senior work because that is very high margin. Like some of mm. our some of our business units are at like fifty percent plus margin. Mm. Um, and others are less so. So the average across the business comes out at 30. Um, but, but, you know, what you realize as we spoke to people over the years is that they're worried about fear and a concentration. They're worried about client concentration. Um, you know, they want to, they're mitigating all the risks that they buy something and then it all just kind of collapses. So it's cool. hard like, to get to a business that, that is, is difficult. And particularly private equity, if you tick boxes that are skeptical about investing in recruitment business, the number of deals done versus other sectors is small. It is small. Anyway, so we were starting to get interest. And as I said, as I diligenced, particularly private equity, you know, for people that don't know, you know, when private equity looked to make an investment, the thing that people need to focus on is not the point at which they're doing the transaction, but what's the plan? Like each of these private equity houses has to create an exit paper to go to their credit committee and say, okay, we're going to invest in Hoxo. And in three years time, we're going to sell Hoxo for three times the amount of money. Mm -hmm. And they won't get signed off to do a deal unless they can show a business plan that shows Hoxo tripling in, in value. Otherwise it's just not worth it for a private equity house. No. Now to triple the recruitment business is unbelievably difficult particularly when you've got it to a level of maturity, it's super hard. And you have to be in a sector that's either super high growth or you put together a business plan that's very, very difficult. And it all seems fine at the time, but once you've collected your cash from the private equity house, they are then on you and you are under pressure to try and triple the business. And then all sorts of decisions start getting made that the people who've been through this said it didn't make sense, but the private equity house was so obsessed with trying to triple we started doing all sorts of weird and wacky things to, to try and make something make sense. Then compound that with, for the last 10 years, debt has been effectively zero. The cost of debt was nothing. All of these private equity deals are financed through debt. And we're now in a regime where if you are trying to service debt, it's challenging, right? It's expensive and it's, it puts you under pressure. So we looked at it and said, okay, I'm not, we're not convinced about this route. Of private equity didn't look attractive but we did want to crystallize value for shareholders and we had two of our major shareholders were just at a totally different stage of their careers they were much senior mm -hmm. like 20 years more senior than us so we had this conundrum in front of us okay okay we want to crystallize value for shareholders and allow the senior shareholders to exit we want to retain control we, we don't want to give up autonomy. We don't want a private equity house breathing down our neck, telling us what to do. 
we don't want to put loads of debt into the business in a regime where we think interest rates are climbing. And we want to incentivize all of the people underneath us. Right? This is like a very hard thing to achieve. And to be honest with you, we spoke to some advisors and we thought it was almost impossible. Some advisor says that you can't have your cake and eat it. If you want to exit, yeah. you have to compromise. And then one of the corporate finance houses we were talking to suggested an employee ownership trust. And it almost seemed too good to be true. And um, because the way an employee ownership trust works is you set up a trust like tomorrow, let's take Hoxo. you set up a trust and that trust is for the benefit of all your employees. Right. And then you value Hoxo. You get an independent valuation. Let's say Hoxo is worth a hundred million pounds. Wow. <laughs> Let's just say one million for, for easy ease and less. Like, well, I'm selling, I'm sure, I'm selling. <laughs> no, it's like a hundred million pounds. The trust then buys Hoxo from the shareholders. Now the issue there is that you've just only set the trust up. It doesn't have a hundred million pounds. So the way this works is the trust would buy Hoxo from you and then it would owe you a hundred million pounds. And the way it pays you back is that each year, the profits from Hoxo, instead of going out to the shareholders of dividends, it will go to the trust and the trust pay it out to the shareholders. And so effectively what you get is shareholders getting their value, but they have to wait Right. So the, the difference between just selling is that you get if, if a private equity house comes to buy you or a trade purchaser comes to buy you, you'll get a big chunk day one with an employee ownership trust. You don't get that. Instead, you're earning that money over a number of years. But the big um, incentive to do that is that the government like this structure. They want companies to transition their businesses to the employees. And so they say, if you do it this way, the consideration, the money you get over time there's huge tax incentives. You pay very little tax on it. So the deal is, okay, you get to crystallize value. You're going to get your money over time. You'll get it at a very favorable tax regime. And at the end of the, at the, once you've paid off all the money, rather than the company be owned by a private equity house, it will belong to all the employees. So once, it's, once you've paid off your debts, the profits of the company at that point get put into a pot and paid out to all the employees. And so at that stage, you're in an unbelievably strong position because in addition to paying people base salaries and commissions and bonuses, you'd then be distributing all of the profits out amongst all the employees. So it's hugely motivating to say, okay, we get to do all of this. We get to crystallize value. Yes, we have to wait over a period of time to get the money, but we get to retain control and autonomy. Um, there's incentive for the selling shareholders because they're going to get their money at a very favorable tax rate. And at the end of this process, rather than the private equity house own it or the trade purchase own it, it will belong to the employees. And so we looked at it and thought this is a, just an amazing structure. Particularly How long are we talking that? What, what, again, you don't have to go into the pure detail, yeah. but what's that time frame that you're going yes, to, that's to a good pay question. shareholders? And, yeah. So it if it's 35 it years and they're, and they're yeah, 65 no. years old, think, it's a bit... Yeah, so I think it depends how well the business does. I think in ours, we were aiming for it to be done over seven or eight years. And then there were some business plans that we put together that showed five. And there were some business plans put together that showed 10. And it, and it kind of depends on what we can do. But on the basis that you can show modest growth, you know, it, it, it can be a relatively short period of time. If you can do something exponential, which we are trying to do, it could be much shorter. Um, but it, it, um, it ticked every box for us. And particularly this point to kind of what are you going to do with your life? I'm 43, you know, my co-CEO is a little bit older, you know, all of us, you know, people in the business who are running the business are all in their kind of early to mid forties. All of us were looking at it saying, okay, we're going to be, we want to be doing this for another 15, 20 years at least. So there's no rush for us, right? It's like your point. If you exit the business, you get a bit of money, but then what? And so we really enjoy it. We love what we do. We built a successful business. It's like a lot of fun. So here's a structure where we can crystallize value. We can earn above the line and below the line. And at the end of the day, the business will belong to the employees. And at that point, which is if it works, it would be incredible. We would be able to go out into the market and say, okay, our consultants through a combination of base salary commissions and the profits from employee ownership trust, you'd be paying people, 60, 65, 70% of what they're billing. 
because there's no shareholder to divvy up profits to. There's no private equity house. There's no major George shareholders. It all goes back to the employees. And at that point, your competitive advantage would be huge. Absolutely huge. Um, Sounds incredible. Lot- the one thing I'm thinking, though, is like at the point of the, the scheme being put in place, yeah. Does that include every current member of staff and all future members of staff that just keep entering the scheme? And then, or is it everyone that was involved at point of transaction? And then you need to do it again in the future for any new people to be part of the game. So it's a discretionary trust. So what happens is you set up a trustee board and you have to, the trustee board has to have two employees on that board. So our trustee board is my co CEO. Um, and then two employees, one of our exiting shareholders, and then someone totally independent. And those five at the moment, it will change, but those five would effectively um, make a decision year on year as to who gets what from that truck, from that pot of money. And so it's just discretionary. Let's just say that you have a million pounds of profit that has been going to shareholders. And that once this scheme's done, that will then in theory sit in a trust that trustee board would sit and decide, okay, who's going to get what? Everyone would get something, but they would effectively act as a discretionary trust to say, okay, we're going to give this to this and this to Y, et cetera, et cetera. But you will end up with, if everyone in your business owns the business, eventually, will that not be a, could that not be a messy place to have so many shareholders all having opinions? Is it, is it then you've got a structure that allows there's a, there's still a board who make decisions, et cetera. Absolutely. Yeah. So you're kind of, you're separating ownership from management. So there would still be a management team and an executive. They would run the business. Um, it's like today, our, we have one shareholder. SSQ has one shareholder, which is the employee ownership trust. Now they delegate to the management team to run the business day to day, week to week, month to month. And that would continue in the future. So, you know, the business would still have an executive team, a board effectively that ran the business, a CEO and FD. But rather than that money going out to shareholders as dividends, it would get distributed back to the employees on a discretionary basis. Um, so, yeah. Sounds incredible. I just keep going on mute, by the way, because of the noise in the background is incredible. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know. The chances of this happening today, I'm like, oh, God. Um, <laughs> Jonathan, I mean, all I can say is it's, it's incredible, I think. One, your career trajectory. Two, the way you've structured the business. Three, the numbers and the way in which the business operates. I think so many people listening to this will be like, wow, it's, it's very different. You know, it's very interesting. It's very different. Um, if someone is trying to grow their business and drive the EBITDA to a, to a mm-hmm. position that is, you know, higher than your 10, 15%. I know it's a really quite a big question, but have you got any, like, say, a few practical things that you guys do and measure and think about that enables you to to to, to go for that those higher end? I mean, thirty percent might be, like yeah. I said, the top end of your partner network might be unrealistic for a lot of businesses. But is there any obvious things you think that most professional services recruitment firms should be thinking about in order to increase yeah. profit percentage? Well, that's a tough question. Um... I think a lot of it does drive from the type of recruitment you're doing. So I'm not going to sit here and pretend that we're like business geniuses. We are beneficiaries. We are lucky that we have a business where we have very high margin work. So we have the luxury of doing very high value stuff at scale. And so that allows us to have a high margin. And I think it's quite hard just to replicate that unless your market gives you that flexibility. So I just say that as a starting point. Um, I would say that's at least like 50 to 60% of the, of the reason we end up with our margin is just we're in the right market doing the right work. So you can't make that. By the way, that's, that's advice there and right there. Are you, right. in, you know, are you in the market yeah. that's going to put you to the right level? Are you, are you, yeah. are you operating? Because they say, you know, it's not necessarily, it's, it's not always about the, what you do. It's the boat you're in that, you know, it's, yeah. the, it's the vehicle you're in that can get you to that level. So that's number one. Yeah. So that's number one. The second is... It's the point I made before. Like, I think you have to look in a disciplined way in how many people are sat in your business not driving revenue and what are you paying for that? And I think that's a, that's a challenge that businesses face as they get bigger. And again, I said, look to the States where these technology companies have had to reconcile that in the last year. 
um, it's a tough exercise. And there's mission creep. Effectively, as businesses grow, you invest in stuff, you bring people on board, and mission creep happens. All of a sudden, you turn around and you've probably got like 15 to 20 people in your business, and you need to be like forensic and say, okay, what are they doing and how are they driving value? So I think being disciplined about working out how many people in your business you have like that. Um, we keep a very close eye on matching revenue to costs. So each of our teams, our business units, have their own PL. And it's broken down like the PL of the overall business. And so we're looking at, you know, what's the margin of each business? How much infrastructure are they using? What's their pro rata share of finance, HR, legal, tech, whatever it is? And then are each of those businesses operating on a standalone basis as a high margin business? I think what, and I'm just guessing here, I think what tends to happen in a lot of recruitment businesses is there is one or two teams that are their rock star businesses, absolutely rock star. And if you were to isolate them, they would be really healthy margin businesses. And then you have a ton of other businesses or adjuncts around the sides that are nowhere near the margin because all recruitment companies like to grow and you start doing all sorts of other stuff that maybe you should be doing or maybe you shouldn't be doing. And if you looked at each of those separate teams on a standalone PL basis, you would start to see that the margin was really low. Now, I think a lot of recruitment owners close their eyes and say, okay, well, it doesn't matter because the company's at 20% overall and ignore the fact that you've got one business over here that's operating at a 35% margin and another business over here that's operating at a 10. You want to, you need to try and look at, at it business unit to business unit, team to team to make sure each of those businesses are trying to operate at the best margin they can rather than just say, okay, as long as the overall one doesn't mind, because then effectively you've got one team subsidizing other teams. So we try and make each business, by the way, this is just an objective. We, we're not, we don't achieve this each time, right? We have different business units operate at different levels, but we look at the metrics on those bases. I think if you do it that way, you've got the best, you've got the best chance. Jonathan, that those three steps, market you're in, genuinely an analyzing that, looking at your management layers, what you're paying for it, and, and actually, you know, what are people doing? And three, analyzing each business as an individual unit with its own PL. And I think those three pieces of advice are incredible and incredibly useful for people listening, including myself. Okay. Um, okay. I think, look, what you guys have done is, is amazing. I think the trust is something I'd like to keep in touch with you guys on and, and find out more about in the future. Is it coming through? Is it, is it, was it a good decision, you know, and, and in a, in a yeah. very honest way? And, um, if anyone is listening and wants just to pick your brains, Jonathan, you're a super busy guy. I know that. Getting older has been tricky at times. But, but would you give people a bit of time and a bit of yeah. advice? If yeah, yeah, very happy, very happy. More than happy for anyone to email or, or send me a message on LinkedIn. Very happy to yeah. chat amazing we'll do that we'll get we'll get that sorted for you um we'll get you on in the future let's definitely have a follow-up maybe with your yeah, co sure. maybe with your co-ceo and we'll do a we'll do it in, in person or something yeah, yeah definitely. i am i am planning on getting back to some in-person interviews in the next couple of years i don't, oh, I don't why? did you used to do these things face to face yeah yeah the, the first, oh, okay. first few seasons but pre-pandemic it was all in a, in a studio and then i realized you know I, I was i wasn't in london myself and when the pandemic hit, we went global and I was interviewing someone in China one day and Miami the next. And it was just, you know, it became a bit irrelevant. But now, yeah, I still don't want to limit the show to London like it used to be. But yeah, there is like when you're having drilling in the background here, you think to yourself, oh, yeah. I should be. How much of your time is spent doing the podcast versus doing Hoxo? Do my uh, couple of hours a week. Yeah, two oh, really? okay. That's it. Okay. yeah. It's not a huge amount. I mean, it's a big part of the business and it drives a big part of our flow of clients and um and leads and things um i'd like i'm the one of the things i'm doing right now is trying to step out of because sales is about 80 percent of my job right so never want it to be zero i want it to become about 50 percent and 40 percent but uh if i can get it to that 30 to 40 percent maybe 50 percent mark then that will free up a bit of time to do more of this and think more about the show and take it to the next level because Sometimes it just 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 run as opposed yeah. to being something you're consciously trying to impact, if you know what I mean. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, it's, I must say it's awesome. I listen to the episodes all the time, as I tell you at night. Uh, but you always pick up something. Like even if the people you're interviewing are not in our sector or they're just like a totally different part of the market, you always learn like at least one thing where you think, okay, that's interesting. I'll take it away. So it's I think it's been like super positive. It's been very helpful for me. 
Well, thank you so much for listening. Thanks even more for being a guest. And we'll get you on again in the future, mate. All right? All right cheers, mate. Speak soon. Thank you, as always, for listening to today's show. I truly, truly hope that you got value from it. That's the only reason I take time every week is to ensure that my audience, future and existing recruitment owners are learning from each other to make this industry that I love so much stronger. Today's episode was brought to you by Hoxo Media. I am the CEO and founder of Hoxo Media and we are the world's leading content marketing and personal branding agency for recruitment businesses specifically. So we are working with over 200 agencies and 2000 recruiters right now both managing the brands, producing content, building written video podcast content for niche recruitment agencies all over the world, as well as coaching at a desk level, individual recruiters in your businesses, how to be better on LinkedIn. That's how to brand themselves. That's how to produce content. That's how to use the opportunity on LinkedIn to get traffic to their profiles and turn that into business. We're coaching people all over the world every single day. If any of that sounds of interest, please do visit www.hoxomedia.com or drop me, Sean Anderson, a personal message on LinkedIn. I would love to talk to you. I'll see you soon.